I'm very pleased now to uh, introduce uh, Samar Sen uh, from the, the security services uh, section of Deutsche Bank. And, uh, and uh, Samar, uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing about uh, uh, Deutsche Bank's API journey, specifically in regard to how you're connecting the different players within the security services ecosystem. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and thanks for being here. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. Okay, you're all set. Right then. Okay, um, we're here to talk uh, talk today about post trade, uh, connecting clients, custodians, and counterparties via APIs. So, without further ado, let me jump into it. Uh, the, for the agenda, I would like to cover what we do and who we are, uh, why APIs are so important in our space, um, given some of the macro uh, challenges and legacy issues that we're trying to solve, um, the, uh, Deutsche Bank's journey uh, and our learnings, wh whatever we can share uh, with the wider group, uh, and where we think some of the future trends are going. And then hopefully we'll have time for some questions. I'm going to try and keep it snappy so I can cover uh, as much content as possible. Um, so. Uh, you know, hopefully we will have time for questions at the end. So uh, very quickly, we are we are a local custodian uh, operating in 30 markets. Um, we offer post-trade services, right? So that's after execution. We, we're talking about safekeeping, settlement, fund administration, um, asset servicing, things like that. Uh, and we, you know, the scale of our business is significant. We, you know, we're safekeeping trillions of dollars worth of securities. Uh, for thousands of clients, and uh, our typical clients are what you see, um, various types of asset managers, uh, the, the, the names you're familiar with, global custodians, wealth management, etc. Um, and, you know, my role in this business is to try to use technology to either create efficiencies uh, or build new revenue lines or uh, improve the client experience. So why APIs are important in our industry? So let's look at the macro story and where we fit in the chain. If you look at the investment value chain today, let's let's look at the example of maybe um, a U.S.-based, uh, you know, massive mutual fund or asset manager that's looking to invest in India or Hong Kong. So you have an investor and an asset manager, and you know that section is called you know the fund management or investing. Um, and when they want to you know place a trade, let's say uh, you know they inform their broker, they inform their global custodian. The broker works with the exchange and also the sub custodian in the local market. Um, and, you know, obviously, uh, broke the brokerage and exchange part is called execution. And, you know, below you've got custody and post trade. And then, of course, beyond that, you have all the settlement that happens in the back end afterwards, uh, delivery versus payment, clearing, um, CSDs and potentially transfer agents. And that's called clearing settlement. Now, this is quite a complex web you see, right? It's, uh, there are a lot of hops uh, between multiple parties. So what this actually means for the backup stream for the investor and asset manager is that it's quite opaque uh, in terms of the processing and when there are delays. People are not really sure why they're where, where the delays happen and why, um, given the multiple hops. Um, there's a lot of, all these orange, orange message bars are basically you know, a combination of swift messages and um, uh, EF electronic front fund transfers and things like that. Um, and also there's a lot of batch processing going on uh, at various legs that people aren't aware of. So there's this perception that things could be faster and some counterparties get information faster than others. And why? Um, another frustration is when, when you want to enter a new market to trade, like let's say you're trading in Hong Kong, but then you want to trade tomorrow in India, it's quite a long process to get licensed. Um, and that's uh, prohibitive. Uh, of course, there are there seem to be a lot of middlemen. Of course, there are reasons for all these institutions being in place um, and political reasons, regulatory reasons, investor protection reasons. But it is quite complex um, and it makes it hard to file your taxes, to adhere to all the regulations and local requirements, etc. And of course, within the industry and the investment side, there's a cost pressure on fees. People are trying to bring costs down. Um, and so overall, we get an inconsistent uh, investor experience upstream. And so us downstream, we think that we can alleviate a lot of these problems with APIs uh, if some of the ca counterparties in the, at the downstream stage work together. And that's what's happening. 
So I'll share what's going on on DB's uh, journey. Give me a sec. Um, so the first challenge we wanted to tackle when we got into all this is, uh, you know, we were looking at a lot of the manual queries we're getting intraday. We said, let's look at one market with one key client. And giving an example, we saw that we were getting over over a small period of time, like maybe a few weeks. We were we had four thousand inquiries coming by email, by call. Uh, most of them were related to trade settlement. What happened to my trade? Why did it fail? Did it settle? Um, and we looked at one day, and we saw that in one day we could get hundreds of these types of queries, and it takes hours and hours to process. Maybe this is something that we could automate. It would it would improve our service to our customers. Maybe it could be self service even. Um, and this this would be quite powerful, and it would be a good starting point for us. So this is what the process looked like before. You would have a client, you know, our clients are typically big institutions, but their end investors would be calling the client, our client, and the cl that client would call us. We would call our operations. It was a massive, complex chain. But we noticed that they were also using Symphony to chat. Um, now, many of you who are outside uh, financial services may not be aware but Symphony is a, 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 a popular um, messaging um, and and more uh, tool uh, in the financial, especially popular in the financial services industry. Um, it's similar to you know in the tech space what you see as Slack or uh, Bloomberg. But you can so you can you can have conversations between multiple counterparties in a secure way. But it's also modular, so you can build automated workflows and and visual experiences within uh, within this chat. So we thought, hey. What if we uh, you know, automated at least the conversations that were happening in the chat? So our API journey actually began, began with a chatbot. We said, OK, let's build a chatbot and see if we can actually pull out data that we have in our back end and deliver it to our customers. We have never done that before historically because, again, these are old businesses typically built on legacy systems and mainframes and things like that. Um, but we, we, were at the, we were at the cusp of a new revolution in our business. And so what we said was, we can uh, clients can send requests to us by mobile app or desktop app. We will authenticate them, um, and then what we'll do in the back end is we will talk to our core system, or we will talk to a market intermediary, financial intermediary like a CSD, and combine that information and give it back to the client in real time. So that by building it on Symphony, we didn't need to build an API gateway. We had a channel already um, that was twenty four seven available. Um, and we, you know, fully mobile, um, and we've built bridges, extensions to WeChat and WhatsApp as well, um, and near instant re reply, and supporting client to bot, but also bot to bot. Some of our clients who already have their own bots to field customer requests could then put their bot in a room with our bot, and we were able to automate that as well. So it was quite powerful, and what we did was we basically reimagined this to more like this which we saw some success in, and we, it gave us confidence that we were able to unlock some of our backend data uh, to think about something that was more uh, direct API focused. So the, the, our Symphony chatbot use cases work for specific clients and specific use cases, and we can be quite quick to market. But we believe that the end client experience could be much further improved with deeper integration. And that's why we shifted our focus, even though we continue the Symphony work, we shifted our focus to also in parallel building our direct API channels. So if you were to ask me, you know, with some retrospect and what I've seen over the years, how would you successfully assemble a, 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 an, an API offering within a large organization like a bank? Look, I don't have the answers, but I do have a few, you know, if I were to distill it into a few key, key um, topics, what I would say is, firstly, you kind of need to acquire the right uh, technology and talent to be able to offer a, a, a scalable and stable uh, uh, gateway uh, and platform to deliver your APIs. And what we did at uh, Deutsche is we, we acquired a company called Contiguous some years ago. We inherited their tech stack, which gave us the gateway entitlements, great talent as well. Um, and you know it gave us the ability to build APIs that were push and pull. So query APIs, but also us streaming data to client endpoints, um, which, is, which is good for different use cases. Um, of course, uh, many of you already are probably on this journey, but unbundling your core, right? So the idea that you may have uh, systems or even legacy systems, which were not very easy to query, um, the idea that you could sort of unbundle a lot, uh, all of that into microservices uh, is something that's quite powerful. 
in order to, to, to deliver these APIs as individual services. And so that's what we did. You know, we, we, we worked on unbundling a lot of our um, data, uh, a lot of our services. Um, and then we, we put on top of that some of the, the newer indexing databases, uh, the same ones used in search, et cetera. You may have heard of Elastic and things like that. And we've, we found that that gave us really snappy real-time lookup capabilities. Um, and at the same time, we improved our connectivity to all the different exchanges uh, and CSDs in these various local markets because that's also a choke point. And uh, if, it, if it's batch and slow at, at that stage, um, there's nothing we can do to speed it up. So it's a, you know it's a it's a it's a collaboratory effort across all the counterparties to sort of speed up the back end of post trade. And then finally, I would say the central the centralizing of standards is very helpful, right? Because what you don't want to do is have people building APIs in all kinds of areas. Uh, so what we did was we put together a central team that gave us that gave different business vertical standards and tools, and they helped with prioritization of the the different APIs. Um, so we decentral we centralized the uh, the tools and the standards, but we decentralized the build teams, um, and we typically uh, put together API um, payloads that were compliant with international standards, so that they were they would be portable um, and they would be easy for the client to sort of uh, to process. Um, and as such, we were able to launch our developer portal, which you can check out in your own time. But uh, you know, as we continue to build out our menu of APIs. Uh, they will they will be available there. So how did we decide in our business security services um, how to you know what APIs to build first? You know, I talked about the chatbot, but after that, how did we decide what to build first um, and you know in what order? Um, so if you look at a timeline, what I would say is we first started with what we what we call query um, APIs or auto, uh, you know automation of of these queries. So this is typically clients data that we store or client trade statuses and positions that we store on our internal databases that they traditionally have not had access to. And this was opening up of that. So what we found is that that creates operational efficiencies like what I like the, the, the chatbot uh, experience I described to you earlier. Uh, it enables very powerful real time reporting um, either via dashboards that we provide, but even within on the client side that they can build on their end. Um, and then it, of course, then enhances the customer experience. Um, and then there are some great use cases, right? On, on, on being, being able to build real-time settlement status, uh, balances, um, being able to pull positions. So if I'm a client and I want to short sell a trade um, in, in a certain market, but I want to check, do I have enough inventory? You can do a quick API pull for that. If I am a, um, a, a, an Asia-based mutual fund and every time a client um, subscribes to one of my funds or sells out of it, I want to, and I'm not on the SWIFT network, and I want to get all my cash balances and, and, and credits and debits in real time streaming into my, into my ledger, um, we are able to deliver things like that now rather than the client waiting for end of day reports to, to then see their cash statements. So these things are, are, are not massively um, new in the retail space, but they are transformative in the institutional space. Let me dive into the settlement status. It's, uh, oh, and in terms of business model, typically we're thinking of the, these APIs should be free. It's customers accessing their own data. Um, let's look at uh, an example of, of real-time reporting and settlement status. You know, it's, it's not easy to demo APIs because it's just code, right, and, and, and data flow. But it is easy to demonstrate um, what it looks like when you are able to uh, receive APIs and stream this kind of information in real time. So what you're looking at, if you look at, ignore the stuff at the bottom, but what you're looking at is this, is in real time, what we're able to stream to a customer is all their trades. So each all these bubbles you see are their trades. Um, and, and they're able to see as they approach settlement date and after exactly whether their trades are getting matched or not. So if you could see, I'll just give you a glimpse of what it might look like in real time. So you'll see the trades are moving from S minus two to S minus one to, to trade settlement date. And then what, what happens is, is that if you click on one of those trades, let's say, what you see now is something much more akin to or familiar when you're ordering a grab or ordering food, um, this is real-time updates that are quite 
common in the consumer space and also in the brokerage space. But in the post-trade space, this kind of transparency has been difficult to build. Um, and we are starting to get there where we are offering, we are able to offer things like this now to our customers. And we're, we're quite excited about the possibilities. Uh, now, uh, beyond just giving these kinds of real-time updates, uh, it would be quite useful to also build in workflows for error correction. So if you look at the example from earlier, you see some trades on the right-hand side have green uh, uh, circles around them. Those are trades in error, and maybe we could build workflows that allow, allow an operations or treasury user to fix that um, on their end without even having to call us or, um, or send us messages or, or raise alerts. And so in this example, what you see is someone going into a problem trade uh, and then being able to realign it uh, and fix it immediately on their end. And that kind of transparency uh, is powerful. And what we also envision is rather than building these API links into each and every one of our clients, some of whom don't have capabilities to work with APIs or to build their own APIs, um, we are also looking at partnering with a lot of the systems that our clients use. So ma many of them are using very popular trading and risk systems. Many of them are using uh, treasury management and ERP systems. So rather than building connectivity into each of our clients, so for some, for, for some uh, use cases, we're also looking at partnering directly with the, the, the front ends that our clients use, the most popular ones, because then we become compatible automatically for our clients. And that's quite powerful as well. So we talked about the first phase that we call query automation. The second phase I would describe as instruction processing and exception workflows. So this is where, where it's more two-way traffic, I would say. So you know, in, rather than just querying data, you can also build exception workflows, request to prioritize trades. We can also do things like onboarding, voting for corporate actions, um, market entry tools. So can we, you, can we build a tool where you can, via API, send us all the info we need to file an, uh, a, a foreign portfolio license on your behalf? Yes. So we are looking at that and working on that. Um, and, but we need to do much better uh, for many more markets. Um, we are also looking, looking at building some machine learning based insights and, and, and being able to predict fails of trades based on the market, the notional value, the time of day. Uh, we, you know, we have, we're sitting on a lot of data. And if we're able to, at the time of trade, pass back to the client a warning that, hey, this may actually fail. You might want to look at your, your order. Uh, that's, that's quite powerful as well. And so we are calling these. Um, more uh, instruction processing, exception workflow type APIs. And uh, this could be pr premium, right? Because there, there could be additional value to the clients here. Um, uh, and and it, it could be expensive on our side to provide some of that. Now, the final stage that I want to touch on, and that's when we talk about, you know, what the future could look like for our business is, uh, is you know, uh, you know, and maybe a couple of years from now is more on the open APIs. So what, we, what, what I've been describing have, are more like partner APIs or, you know, I wouldn't say private APIs, but partner APIs where existing customers of ours are able to use um, or access our data. But it's not open, fully open, where third parties who have nothing to do with us can kind of use these APIs to, to get access to markets and use our custody as a service. And so this has potential to, to build, build new revenue streams for us if it comes to pass. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of factors that, that we need to look at. So I think probably it's the right time to look at the future um, as, uh, and, and discuss, you know, wh where things could go. Just give me one sec. So, you know, the question I posed earlier is, will truly open APIs become a reality in the post-trade world? Right. And it depends on a lot of things. Now, if you look at, you know, some of the in the in the in the retail. So so what they say is, you know, things all the innovation always comes to retail because you have finicky customers and, you know, low switching costs. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of innovation there. And now, you know, you, in, in finance, we've seen it come to the, the merchant banking and SME side. Um, and, you know, it's taken longer to come to the B2B side, the institutional side. But we are there today. Um, our clients who used to be okay with green screens and mainframes are not anymore. They want the same experience that they get when they order a pizza 
uh, or when they, uh, you know, when they buy movie tickets online or sh go shopping, they want that same experience you know, when they go to work and they uh, deal with uh, when they deal with uh, counterparties uh, for their trades. So that's where we are getting to. Um, but it's on the retail side, it's much, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been much more mature. So when you think about uh, aggregation, companies like Played are already sort of turning that on, right? Mint exists because of the, you know, the underlying um, work that's being done by, by in the open banking space. Um, pay, uh, when you look at payments, Stripe's a good example. There are many examples. Um, when you look at cards, you have companies like Marqueta, um, banking, you have Fido and many, many others. Uh, lending, Cabbage, well, not anymore, right? They got acquired. But you get my point. I think if we were to think about uh, how I would describe some of these companies is these are very scalable platforms and industry transformative. Now, based on all the work that we do, we're doing that I described to you, you know, so we are unlocking our services as well. Are we able to, in a similar fashion, deliver custody as a service, deliver market entry as a service, deliver FX as a service, fund administration, stock lending, which is also a very interesting business. Um, now, Technology-wise, there's no reason why we couldn't. Um, you know, APIs are not uh, a new technology, but the way that people have been putting them to use and some regulation um, has really changed things. Um, a lot for us depends on regulation. Um, so regulation has made some great strides uh, uh, for C the PSD2 and CSDR are two examples which forced uh, you know, institutional banks to to ramp up some of their uh, API uh, deliverable deliverables because otherwise we wouldn't be able to keep up with those initiatives. Um, but there are reasons why uh, and very stringent rules why um, uh, in certain markets or many markets around the world you cannot uh, sh freely share information. Um, in fact, uh, information stored about customer positions and customer ownership. Uh, needs to stay on servers on in that country. Uh, KYC procedures is very complicated in every diff in, uh, and it varies from region region to region. The legal agreements that get signed with these with our you know with our institutional clients are are quite extensive. So could we you know retail and high volume this this kind of uh, this kind of offering? Well, I'm not sure, but I do think that there are promising signs. And many of the, 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 the buttons you see on the right, I think, are going to be doable and buildable. Uh, it's just a matter of doing it responsibly together with the regulators. Um, in, uh, but, uh, but I think in the end, in, in, some years from now, um, at the end of the day, customers will benefit from this. Now, so, I want to quickly so, so, touch on Swift so, yeah. and then wrap up. Hello? Okay, all right. So yeah, Matt, yeah, we had we had a quick question, Major. I think this very um, this slide that you have on screen is is uh, is interesting. The sorts of examples of great APIs. There was a question in the chat about um, what are what are the main predominant styles of APIs that are that are in use at, use at Deutsche Bank? Is it REST? Is it? Uh, I, I think the fixed protocol is is very popular in the financial markets area. Um, which is based on so XML, um, event driven. What what are the main styles? Yeah, so look, we 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 have a combination. So mm -hmm. REST, SOAP, um, but uh, you know, I, you know, I would rather get our uh, our API Central team to mm -hmm. give you that, but I can get you that answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now we also are, are in terms of the payloads. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they are JSON, uh, and yeah, ISO two hundred twenty two standard. Right. Okay. So, so you, sorry, you were going to mention Swift quickly, and yes. then, yes. and then, so and then I think I, yeah. So, the reason I wanted to mention Swift. So, look, Swift is is a, a collaborative that was started by the banks to facilitate messaging, um, and it works very well still. Uh, you know, when when people talk about delays, usually it's not related to Swift. It's related to the the multiple hops uh, and uh, and uh, and batch processing that happens within some of these counterparties. So, if banks and different counterparties start talking to each other across APIs, um, you know, how does, you know, what happens with Swift? So at the end of the day, what I would say is our end customers and end investors, they want standardized messages for all the scenarios that they're interested in. Uh, they want the security to be up to par. 
Um, and they want, and this is the most important point, they want low engineering costs when building this API connectivity, and they want very low switching costs when they change provider. They don't want it to be painful if they want to change provider because we have they have APIs built. So Swift, if now based on what I told you earlier, it would make sense for Swift to also probably get into the API gateway space and be uh, be a, a share a, you know a common platform that that all counterparties could plug into. And so if Swift built their own global API gateway that was independent from their messaging network, customers would get consistent API payloads uh, and a standardized security model. And most importantly, the idea is that they would probably need to plug in once into this. And then on the back end, banks would plug in all their various API services, but in a more consistent way. So whether it's Swift or whether it's other types of banking consortiums, people are saying that as these services get unpacked, um, if, if they are all built uh, uh, in with different tech stacks and it's painful for customers to switch, then it means that we haven't cracked it or we haven't done it right um, in the industry. And so these are other themes to think about uh, when we think about how it's going to go, how it's all going to work going forward if we if APIs start to proliferate. So, so Samar, just to 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 wrap up, yeah. I, I think you you're talking about the the role of Swift could be helpful in uh, driving standards. Um, what what are the what are the key what was the key takeaway you want to leave the audience with? Yeah, so key takeaway, right? I'm going to wrap up now. So look, getting back to the original diagram, I, th I hope I've convinced you that you know, with, with counterparties working together and different people upgrading their infrastructure, um, you know, APIs can really deliver value upstream back to the investor and asset manager. What people are also saying is that in the future, many of these functions, there may be a lot more sharing among all these counterparties and that's where a good use case comes in for distributed ledger technology. So that's another theme to watch out for. And there may be disintermediation of some of these roles and, and players. We don't know. But I think that it's an exciting time and we're excited to take part within it and we're trying to deliver this. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Samar, for that uh, uh, view of the, of the uh, custodian uh, ecosystem. Um, it's been very, uh, very refreshing. So we've got uh, an insurance view and then now a uh, corporate institutional view. Uh, we're going to go now to hear from. Thank you. Um, th thanks for thanks very much.